G'day listeners, welcome to Bar Karate, the sailing podcast for another week. Cannot wait to talk sailing this week. We've got a great guest, a fantastic guest actually. Very excited about that. My name is Jordan Spencer and to make all this action happen, I need two good mates. The first one is my buddy Brett Perry. Greetings, exalted one. Good evening. Saturday night, what's going on? Saturday night, this is a bit rough. Don't give that away. We thought we were all on the plane tomorrow, mate. That was what we're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you didn't tell me the rules before we started. (laughs) I'm still publishing the rules. (laughs) We're all still publishing. Lucky I know your boss. (laughs) (laughs) We're all pumped. But my God, I can tell you what, in Sydney at the moment, rain, rain, rain. Last week, fire, 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 and 35, 40 degrees. This week, rain, you just got, uh, it's just insane. Mate, you guys get 70 mils and it's the world's over. Where I live, like, we get 300 mils a night. It's just oh, we, had a, no, no, we, had a, we had 100 We had a hundred and something yesterday and 100 and something today. That's oh, enough. Good. That's good. That's a lot of rain. Yeah, that is a lot of rain. Fire should be out. <laughs> well, it, uh, I don't even know if it's getting in that far. That's the problem. Oh, okay. Anyway. Let's bring in Bicey. Let's bring in Bicey because we, uh, we need to get the threesome going. Let's uh, welcome to the show. He had a voice that could make a wolverine purr. Mr. Nick Bice. Now, see, BP, this is what I d- planned. When I was going to ask Bicey a question, I was going to say, Bicey, what were you up to last Saturday, on Saturday, just gone? Just so oh. people would know, but now everyone knows we're recording. Mm. What were you up to today, Bicey? Oh, mate, I'm a little dishevelled, actually, a little hot, a little flustered, and it's been a big day for many and going to be an even bigger night for all that are attending the Brighton and Seacliff Yacht Club Centenary Regatta celebrations. Mm. Our, um, our friend from Down Under Sale, Harry Fisher, asked me to join him today to be part of his team to help with uh, some of the promo for what was a great day. And uh, I must say, if we weren't uh, recording this right now, I'd still be there, <laughs> which was last night. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, anyway. <laughs> and I probably would still be there. <laughs> but um, often on the, on the podcast, we talk about what needs to be done to promote sailing. And uh, I was walking down the beach the, uh, this morning at 10 o'clock and I counted 35 optimists out there having a crack as part of the Tackers program. Okay. So uh, Brett Yardley's uh, gig there, fantastic. Um, so that that was huge. Um, and so for those uh, I promised to have a beer with um, and those that tapped me on the shoulder to compliment Bar Karate and what we are up to, I apologise for doing the good old-fashioned piss house trick, but um, Bar Karate beckoned and I had to, uh, had to leave. And Jordan, you're going to love this one. I ran into some of you. Some of the greatest legends of the sport that said you were lucky enough to know them. Yep. Dicko being one. <laughs> um, not... And, of course, the one one of the greatest of all time, Pip Pearson. Oh, yep. um, they all say you were the second best forward end ever. Second best forward end. I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're that still is searching. They're still searching for, for the, the best. best. That's it. <laughs> Don't want to sound egotistical. That's right. <laughs> exactly. And um, I was lucky enough to catch up with the current 505 national champions, Fritz, very briefly, and of course our good mate Snowdy, who I left hanging. Um, by the way, he still owes me a beer because I brought his last one. <laughs> and uh, but all in all, a great day celebrating a hundred years. Imagine that a hundred years of history for a great club and one of the most encouraging things actually I walked away with was a clear vision from the club and they had two key words that which we have also mentioned on this show Barcarati. In, inclusion and fun there you go and I really really love that and that came from the top it came from the Commodore the rear Commodore um, so that was really good to hear and um, for those that want to check it out, um, the great day myself and Harry had, go to either Down Under Sale, Brighton Seacliff Yacht Club, or Barkerati Facebook page, check out all the action. But, yeah, it was awesome, awesome. Standing out the end of the pier, doing a bit of commentary from the uh, start um, of what they – uh, multiple starts. We had uh, many people, not only just club members, but a lot of the general public too. So really, really good day. Yeah, very cool. J Dog, he's amped. He is pumped. He's absolutely amped. He's yeah. pumped. Actually, I, yeah. I will say, um, <clears throat> Barkerati has gone off. Like we we keep saying it's going well, but it's gone off now. So 
We are getting a huge number of people calling us and sending us emails and telling us things. And it's got to the extent that we cannot do uh, one show this week. We're actually, I'm just telling for all those people that called in, we're doing a special uh, call in feedback uh, show midweek. So we're doing the in between a show middle of the week this week, where we're just going to go through all these things that we've had some feedback on. So that if you, you call us and you're going, I hope they talk about what we're doing. Um, then probably going to talk about it uh, during the middle of the week, uh, but we've got a great show lined up anyway. So just telling you this week, it's two shows because we can't fit it all into one. Is that cool? Love it. Love you it. You know why we can't fit it all into one? Because I suspect that we will talk to our special guest for a long, long time. We, we, really, <laughs> we really like this lady, and uh, we are blown away just for the fact that she's uh, here to talk to us. Um, first, let's just get it into the show. Welcome, Caroline Brow. Welcome to Bar Karate. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me. So very welcome. So very welcome. Um, do you reckon anybody in the sailing world doesn't know who you are? <laughs> it's a big question to start. Straight to the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is my way of saying, do I, I need to do an intro? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe Bicey should have asked that today. It is uh, it is regatta. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's enough for people in All right, well, there know me, but yeah, there you go. Let me let me just uh, throw a few things out there so people who are, don't know who, if they perhaps don't know who you are, they probably realise. So first off, you're Dutch, so uh, you're tall. Um, <laughs> three Olympics in the 470 in the Europe and the Tornado. Um, so 2000, 2004, 2008, um, you are the first female, along with Marie Ryu and Justin Mitro, to win the Volvo Ocean Race, um, ISAF World Sailor of the Year twice, um, mm. multiple Wonderful. world champion, anything else we need to mention? Uh, um, and part-time Australian now, we actually claim you as your own because you've married an Aussie. I'm not married. Oh! <laughs> well, they have this thing in Australia called de facto, so <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically you are. <laughs> yeah, I've used that to get my permanent visa, so yeah. <laughs> what, why not married? Is, does he not like you? Oh, I don't know, I'm Dutch. We, we don't, well, we don't do course, that sort of, of stuff. It's not that sort of important, <laughs> is it? No, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we own a house together and we have a kid together, so <laughs> I don't know if, that, if that's not enough proof, then yeah, no, <laughs> don't you know guys, what else you need. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, let's let's <laughs> say you're a, a perfect family then. Let's just call it that. <laughs> um, Thank you. To, before we get into the serious stuff, I have to ask, I don't know where your nickname comes from. Is it, is it just because you, is it like, have I pronounced it right, Khaki? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that that one goes back a long way. Um, wow. I think I have a couple of nicknames, but uh, Kaki goes back to oh, when I was a kid, really young, and my brother, I think, it, yeah, my brother, he couldn't pronounce my name, and um, <laughs> and he ended up saying Kaki, and that's how it stayed. But that's for the really close family and friends. Ah. Uh, I think during the... Um, during the Volvo Ocean Race with the uh, with Team SCA in 2014-2015, I gained uh, the nickname Gyro, and that's <laughs> thanks right. to uh, <laughs> thanks to Liz Wardley because mm. uh, I uh, at the time I was the tallest person that um, she ever knew. And uh, <laughs> if, I, if you guys don't know, well, I, I guess everybody knows Liz Wardley, yeah. but um, they call her Chook. And she's not that big, so right. yeah. Right. She named yeah, the gyro, and it sort of, sort of, yeah, caught on. <laughs> there's a fair height difference between the two of you, but um, in saying that, the two of you got on famously, right? Yeah, listen, I actually, listen, I got on really, really well, and uh, yeah, we still uh, speak to each other a lot. Um, we're generally in different sides of the world. But, um, yeah, we, we even sailed together on a uh, 16-foot catamaran for a while. We did a season mm. together on a, on a Viper and uh, sailed some of the 
did a Europeans and did round Texel, which is a really famous catamaran regatta in uh, in Holland. So yeah, we um, we've come a long way together. Actually, it's cool. And uh, not to forget, of course, uh, Amos Sports, where it all started. Well, that, that's boats. that's where it all started, uh, and that's where I met Liz for the first time. And uh, we were both new to uh, to Amos Sports to the team, and um, we're we both were doing something on the bow of the boat uh, while we're still in the in the marina. And uh, there was this girl, and I'm not allowed to say because <laughs> I'm not allowed to swear on this show. But um, yeah, she was, light profanities she was, are permitted. <laughs> she was just, doing just, a lot just, of it. Just beep and, yourself, Karen. Just beep yourself. Yeah. Then be beep, 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 no. beep, beep. But, uh, no. And um, I started uh, copying her. And um, <laughs> and she then turns around and says, what are you beeping on about? And, uh, and yeah, from then on, yeah, we hit it off quite well. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's, uh, she's a great lass. We, we all love her. So that's cool. We do. So, um, how did you get into sailing? What's, what was your pathway? I guess my pathway would be the what people might call the classical um, sailing school, which is starting in the Optimists and the Oppies. Um, my family, I come from a water sports family. I wouldn't really say sailing family. My parents were both rowers. My dad was actually a very good rower, and I think he always wanted me to be a rower and uh, not a sailor. Apparently, I've got quite a good build oh, yeah, to be a rower will. as well. Yeah, I, I can see but, that. Um, yeah, but it was, um, it was uh, when we were living in Brazil, and um, my parents used to sail together in a 470, and uh, they used to drag my brother and I along to the sailing club. And, uh, yeah, he had an optimist and... When he got good enough, he got a, a a better optimist, a new optimist, and I got given his second-hand optimist, and yeah, I slowly got into it. But I didn't like it initially. Um, it took a long time. I think it was probably only when I was about 11 or 12 um, when I started um, winning races, or not so necessarily winning races, but beating my brother in races <laughs> is when uh, I started enjoying it a bit more so yeah i think i'm a bit competitive is he still sailing he sails you know for the fun of it i yep. uh as long as there's a couple of beers on board that they can crack when they cross the finish line then yeah he sails he has fair good fun fair, with his mates fair cool fair cool <laughs> nothing wrong so, with that so, sounded a bit like the aim of sports project caroline you're all, get, given the second hand um equipment <laughs> <laughs> After Dolts was done with it, here you go, girls. You can deal with this. <laughs> yeah, no, I think not everybody all, about no. that program was a B program, but that's okay. You know, it, it got us. It got us sailing. It got the girls sailing, and it was a huge opportunity. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's an experienced sport, and um, we got around the world, and uh, that's the sure. main thing. That's where it all started for a lot of us. So and we should be so, we should so, be thankful to him. <laughs> Absolutely. And so you go from Optimus in Brazil um, to that point, and uh, what what was the follow-on from the uh, from Brazil, for that matter? Well, we, we then moved back to Holland, and um, and my parents were like, oh, in Holland, that's that's not a good climate for sailing. You don't sail in Holland. And, um, and in Holland, you play hockey. And mm-hmm. so I got given a hockey stick, and I got sent to the uh, hockey club, which is just around the corner from where we lived. But um, I think it was, we'd been in Holland, it was the middle of winter when we went back, it was February, and uh, we um, we went to sort of, we got in the car and we just, to to look the surroundings and just get our bearings from where we were living, and and um, we sail, we drove past a lake, and they were doing a winter training in Optimists, and uh, two weeks later, I had my own Optimists, and I was... Uh, doing the winter training with a dry suit on. I'd never worn more than a, a bikini and a, and a hat and a life jacket. <laughs> mm. um, and, uh, yeah, I was um, in a dry suit um, wearing gloves and a beanie, and uh, off I went. So, yeah, it, my, it was the proof that I really wanted to do it. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I just went on from there. 
You, you northern Europeans are crazy. I just do not know how you go out in those weather, that weather. Oh, you're crazy people. <coughs> um, so, but boss, you were saying, so you went from there, so opti, 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 but uh, did you, what did you go into next? So after the OPI, I sailed a national class, okay. uh, a youth class, um, which was a, a double-handed boat, uh, and I got into it with a, with a good friend from the Optimists. Um, by the age of um, 13, we were too big for an, for an Optimist, so um, we moved into the youth class together. Um, and then I did a lot of the kids out of the Optimists then went on to sail the Europe dinghy. Yep. Uh, but at the time, um, they were just introducing the carbon masts into the uh, Europe dinghy, and uh, it was all uh, a bit too expensive. So I sailed a laser radio for a while, uh, for quite a couple of years. I did my first Youth Worlds. Um, back then, still uh, the IYRU. I don't know if, and if you yep, <laughs> recall yeah. it, go that far back. But yeah, IYRU and IYRU youth, youth Worlds in Scotland. And um, so I did a couple of years in the laser radio. And then, yeah, I guess sort of uh, Olympic ambitions. I, I wanted a bit more. And um, then um, the Europe dinghy was the uh, single-handed dinghy for girls, for women in the Olympics. And so I then gave the, uh, the Europe a try, uh, probably about four, after four or five years in the laser radio. Cool. Then, go on, boss. And um, so, and then that, of course, took you to the Olympics, right? Well, um, no, no, that's an interesting story, actually. A little side because, step. Uh, yes, I, so I, I won two worlds in the Europe dinghy. Yeah. But uh, there was another Dutch girl, Margriet Matthijsen, who um, was also very good, and we were numbers one and two of the world ranking at the time. But uh, for the Sydney Olympics, or well, for the Olympics, there's only uh, one rep per nation, one rep per country in every discipline. And uh, so we had uh, trials um, within Holland uh, to select which sailor uh, would go in the Europe dinghy. And uh, she actually beat me in the trials. So oh. I, I didn't go to Sydney in the Europe dinghy. Um, the Federation um, held the selection trials at a very early stage, I held them in '99, um, a, 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 more than a year before the Olympics. Yeah, sure. With the idea of then whoever didn't make it in the Europe uh, to then uh, put them in the uh, 470 dinghy and uh, and and give that a go. And that's how I ended up. I had a six-month campaign in a 470 uh, dinghy and uh, ended up uh, at the Sydney Games in the 470. Very cool. Well, yep. So. Obviously, that was the introduction to Australia. So, because you did the the Olympics in that 470, and then you you did do the Olympics in 2004 in the Europe, and then you switched to to the tornado, and that is a big change. Was that just because you were chasing Darren, or was that because? <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't in the Europe for starters. Yeah, no, <laughs> but he was in the tornado, so. <laughs> How did that is that is that part of the program or that just was a coincidence? It, it, it didn't quite go like that. <laughs> but, um, it was a byproduct, maybe. No, some, somehow um, it felt like every uh, Olympic discipline or every Olympic class that I chose um, got got removed from the Olympics. So uh, I was sailing the Europe dinghy, and after two thousand and four, they removed the uh, Europe dinghy from the Olympics. Um, and um, in 2008, after I'd done the tornado, a tornado campaign, they removed the tornado from the Olympics. Yeah, yep. jeez, so, so it wasn't a forced. Uh, <laughs> I was obviously <laughs> forced if I wanted to go to the Olympics. I was forced to sail uh, in another discipline, in yep. another class, and um, I could have gone back. Uh, to the laser radio, which uh, then got selected as the uh, single-handed Olympic dinghy for the girls. Mm -hmm. But to me, that felt like a step back in my sailing career yep. because the Europe dinghy is actually a really fine boat. It's got a carbon mast and 
a little bit more development. Uh, don't don't take it the bad way. The the laser is an awesome boat, um, and it's a very competitive boat. But it and you learn like the real basic skills. You know, you you learn about your. Uh, your tactics it's very competitive but you also learn that you know the physical side is really important because you know i've never had to work so hard to go so slow in a boat (laughs) don't don't worry we've discussed the laser many many times (laughs) exactly but you know wherever you go in the world to whichever local club you go the laser laser. is the is the most Mm. competitive fleet. Um, And there's always a good fleet, whether you're on the lake, whether you're out at sea, it doesn't matter where you are, um, there's always a good fleet. And that's the great thing about the laser. But for me as an Olympic sailor at the time, it just felt like a step backwards in my career. So um, I, yeah, decided to just challenge myself and um, have a go in the tornado. Very cool. with that, though, I'm not sure if I should ask this question because I don't know the circumstance, how you went from representing the Netherlands to representing um, uh, Belgium. And I'm not sure if there's a bad circumstance, so talk about it. And the fact that Belgium is a made-up country, is that... <laughs> <laughs> well, that, there's your answer, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do ask all the interesting questions. <laughs> <laughs> if, should we skip past that one or...? No, no, it's okay. I can explain. Uh, I don't mind. Um, yes, the the in the tornado class at the time, uh, Holland had about um, four different teams that were very competitive. Uh, there was actually um, Mitch Booth from oh, originally Australia oh, yes. who um, mm. had uh, turned into a, a cloggy and uh, was sailing for Holland and uh, Mitch is background in catamaran sailing and in tornado sailing specifically um, is huge mm-hmm. and um, he's a very, very good sailor. So we uh, would be up against quite a lot of competition, whereas um, in Belgium, well, the the Olympic squad was pretty uh, non-existent, uh, let alone a, a tornado. And uh we were welcomed with uh, open arms in uh, in Belgium, and um, yeah, that that made it a bit of uh, made it an easy decision to uh, to try that route um, instead of making our life difficult yep. uh, in Holland. Very, yep, understood. Cool. So, um, one of the things that's interesting about your history, which really makes, for my mind, makes you stand out, is the two Sailor World Sailor of the Year awards. There's 20 years between them, <laughs> which is the longest gap between them. But the other thing is there are three other uh, people or uh, four people effectively. One is uh, the, two, the 2470 lasses from Greece who, who won it together. So there's three other people that have won it twice, the World Sailor of the Year. But it's, in each instance, it was for doing the same sort of sailing again, whereas for you... You won World Sailor of the Year for a completely two completely different styles of sailing. Does that mean that you are the best sailor in the world? <laughs> well, it Basically, did, it it did take me more than twenty years. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, some of us haven't got too many yet. I haven't got my first one yet. <laughs> um, no, I guess I guess maybe it just it makes me all round. I guess um, you know I I done um, three Olympics and. Um, I um, wanted to try something different, you know, I, I, and I'm honest about it. I've been to three Olympics and I came home um, without a medal three times, you know, so maybe it's yet yeah, time yep. to, uh, to try something different. And um, I'd gotten a bit of a taste of the offshore sailing um, with Amos Sports uh, too, because I'd only really done uh, two legs with, um, with the team in 2001, 2002. And, it was the two Southern Ocean legs. And I do remember that um, after that, I said to myself, you know, one day I want to um, do uh, do this again, but do a full lap around the world um, and not just a couple of legs. And uh, that's how I slowly uh, started getting into a bit more uh, offshore sailing or well, big boat sailing initially. And then um, and then uh, more uh, miles under my belt through uh, through offshore sailing and Team SEA. And um, going into now Team SEA, like um, 
obviously you had the full female team with AMA Sports, Team SEA being full female team, and then, of course, a, another different dynamic with the uh, Dong Fong. Um, do you want to just elaborate on that a little? Was uh, between the different dynamics? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, for myself, uh, I am, I guess, m more used to sailing in mixed teams than I was in, in full female crews um, until uh, when Dong Feng came along. Um, you know, I'd done a I'd done few legs on AMA Sports and I'd done the SCA campaign. Um, and, you know, people always ask the question, what's it like to um, sail in an, in an all-girls team? Um, and actually, uh, to me, it took a while to get used to that just because I'd been doing the most sailing I'd done was in mixed crews, not just on the big boat sailing, but the tornado mm. campaign I'd, I'd done was uh, effectively a mixed crew as well. Um, it wasn't an open discipline at the time, but um, there weren't many women sailing uh, sailing in the tornado. So um, we uh, we raced against uh, as a mixed team against uh, against guys. So and that's basically how I grew up. So for me, it was more natural to sail in a mixed team than it was in a, in a girls team. I actually had to get more used to sailing um, with SCA than. Uh, than, than with uh, with Dong Feng, but I think both campaigns were obviously um, hugely um, different. Um, but we had w with the girls. I, I think we had a a really strong campaign. I mean, we had 14 girls on on the sailing squad, and uh, we started the race with. Um, the same 14 girls as we finished the race. Um, mm. We were obviously rotating through the through the legs through the course of the race, but um, we had a, a, a really strong team. And um, same with uh, Dong Feng, you know, we 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 rotated as well. Um, but we had the sailors we started with with the the sailors we ended with. And I think um, to me uh, the thing that jumps out um, in the offshore sailing and it's. I think what I enjoy the most about it as well is the team dynamics. And um, obviously that changes from being on a women's boat than being on a mixed crew. But um, it's all about um, how you work um, as a team and how you make it work as a team um, when you're out there in, uh, in the extreme conditions. Um, and I think in both cases, uh, which I think is a, a very positive thing, is that we had a good lead up into the race. And I think that's where mm. you... Uh, you know, get to learn um, learn to know each other and how to work together and how to communicate together, and uh, you grow together as a as a team. You know, you really become um, become a, a family. You spend more time with um, with your crewmates than than you do with your own family. Um, so you learn. You know, you get to know each other's strengths strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and I think. Yeah, it was with Team SCA, obviously, we had a huge lead up, um, which we needed because there was also a huge experience gap. And uh, with Dong Feng, we had about seven to eight months uh, lead up. And I think that's what really why we came out strong as a, as a team, because um, we had that bond together. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, no one can argue with the success of both teams and the achievements of, of both. Um, and I guess you probably sum that up there. But in the if you were to put one point on why you won on Dong Fong, would you go back to that, uh, the preparation? And the yes, team preparation, dynamic? Yes, preparation. I think the, yeah, absolutely the teamwork. Uh, I think in the end, well, everybody saw how close it was um, going into the last leg. And I mean, all the boats uh, were um, sailing fast. Um, all the boats had a good speed, had good performance. Um, mm. So it really came down to uh, the people on the boat um, to make the difference um, in how you sail the boat and how you the decisions you take as a team. And um, and how you work together and how you handle the pressure, and uh, I think uh, because of Dong Feng was, uh, I believe really uh, we had a very special bond. Um, I, I I think I dare say that even if we hadn't won at the end, 
Um, I don't think I would have wanted to be with any other team. I, mm. I think um, um, we we had a lot of fun going around the world, um, honestly. And not that I didn't have fun with Team SCA, not at all. I don't want to, um, you know, put any uh, negative words in, into that campaign because it, it was great as well. It's it's like you said, you know, we it was a different goal uh, with the with the girls. We you know we were trying to put women's offshore sailing back on the on the world map, and we did that very well. Uh, we ended up winning a leg, so I think we did better than uh, than we could have expected. Um, but with Dongfeng, the the goal was to to win the Volvo Ocean Race, and uh, so we put the pressure on ourselves from the start. And I I dare say that I think had we not um, had the the team spirit that we had and the the bond and the fun that we had going around the world, uh, I doubt uh, whether we would have done so well or handled the last leg into the Hague as well as we did. I think yeah, sure. the fact what we'd been through to together as a team and how we um, experienced the race as a team um, helped us handle uh, the pressure of, uh, of the last leg. And um, so I've got a theory um, why you actually won the World oh. Sailor of the Year. <laughs> And I think which it was one, which from, one though, Bicey? Which no, one? The, the, first the, one or the second, second one? Second time round. Um, that smile on your face coming into the final finish in Den Haag. I remember mm. being out on the water, mm. and I think everyone commented on it. I don't think I've ever ever seen a happier person in my life, and uh, so good on you for that. And I'm mm. sure that was a big part. <laughs> Of course, the sailing, but um, the uh, to see someone so ecstatic, and especially sailing into your home country, must have been pretty an unbelievable your, feeling. Pretty much your hometown, almost, isn't it? Like you, with uh, where you, at least where you were born. Like uh, it must have just been incredible. Well, for sure, and like my apartment is uh, was right on the finish line. You know, I could see my apartment <laughs> while I was crossing the finish. So, uh, for sure. It, it was a double t- double celebration for me. Um, I mean, just obviously having the goal to to win the Volvo Ocean Race. I've been around the world um, with the girls, um, and um, when when Charles asked me to join uh, Dongfeng, it was pretty clear that you know from the start the goal was to uh, try and uh, and win the race. The guys had done quite well uh, the race before, finishing third and. Um, so it, it was our goal from the start. And, um, you know, going through uh, the ocean race, we all, we all go through our ups and downs. And um, as a team, we had plenty of them as well. But, you know, to be able to be part of a race where three boats are on equal points going into the last leg, um, that's unheard of, you know, and something like that won't repeat itself in history um, so soon. And to be able to say that, you know, you're, you're, you're part of, of history being made is a pretty cool thing. And um, obviously, you know, coming out on top is, uh, is the icing on the cake. So um, and doing that, yes, in, in your hometown um, is, is just an incredible feeling. I, I, there was people um, on the dock that um, that I hadn't seen, that I'd studied with at university, or, and and that I'd lived with at uni, and that I hadn't seen for possibly 15 years, that were all there to uh, to cheer us on, and yeah, it's it's a pretty an amazing feeling. Well, Carolyn, it's BP here. I'm sorry, I've just been sitting here listening and in awe. Obviously, uh, uh, Boise and uh, and Jordan have uh, met, known you for years. I I personally mm-hmm. never met you. Uh, when you were coming into the finish line, did you have much input into the local knowledge? And did you, oh. when, when you were coming, hey? Well, this is a good question, BP. You're on well, something. Well, you don't I, know. look, I, I'm, I'm an outsider here. Yeah. Well, well, the, the um, <laughs> going into the finish line, like the last, um, as soon as we came around the the tip of Holland uh, at at Texel, actually, 
um, it was pretty straightforward for us. There wasn't all that much we could do um, except just sail the boat as fast as we can because we could because it was a straight line to the finish for us. Um, I just yeah told Pascal at the end to not hit the pier of uh, of Scheveningen um, <laughs> as we're approaching. Good tactics. The Good tactics. I like that. Come on. Yeah. That that looked pretty bad. And um, also we um, when we were studying uh, the last leg. Um, in in Gothenburg before we left, uh, we had uh, uh, Marcel van Triest, actually the only mm-hmm. other Dutch person in the, in the Dongfeng team, and um, obviously um, Marcel Marcel is, is actually the the brains behind uh, behind our decision uh, to go along the uh, the Dutch coast and not offshore. Oh, so and, so sorry to stop you there. So this decision was made before the leg even started to go inside? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is and so good. So for the it listeners, was a very, very gutsy have you not, move. Have you and, not talk, and, spoken about that at all, Bicey, at all? You didn't well, know that. BP, this, <laughs> I, did, I, did, I didn't. But, uh, so what do you got to understand? You, guys, yep, you, you know, you always have a plan A and a plan B, but that was definitely our plan A. And even yeah. Marcel said, you're going to be sailing seven miles um, longer than the guys, or further distance I than bet. the guys very offshore. Very shallow waters. But yeah. very well, shallow. and yeah. very shallow waters, and and um, and. But even during our briefing before the um, before the leg, Marcel even dared mention that you know if there's enough water there, and Pants depending on what time, uh, <laughs> you can go inside one of the islands. Here we go. Um, wow. And okay, when, so, he, when so, he said that, I looked at Pascal and I said, do not do even it. go there. <laughs> would be having done round text on myself on a catamaran and I'm getting stuck on the sandbanks <laughs> so, um, with a very I, I, shallow boat. Um, I said, D- don't even consider that. And um, so, so maybe that's the only bit of input I had. <laughs> before going into the leg. But, yeah, I, I, I dare say our decision, you know, unless the forecast was going to change or, you know, something happened drastically um, um, when we had to do our um, waypoints uh, going into uh, Arus and then up uh, up to Norway, uh, we ran out of breeze. And unless, um, you know, we'd caught, got caught with uh, in um, – in no breeze for longer than we had, then, you know, possibly things would have changed. But, um, yeah, our, um, our plan was pretty set. So oh, there you go. So Good answer. for the listeners <laughs> out there, mm, go back mm. and look at the tracker for the last night of the ocean race, right? What you'll see, because there was three boats that could win. It was Brunel, it was Matt Frey and Dong Fong. Dong Fong and Brunel were coming down the inside. Okay. Uh, Dong Fong and Matt Frey were coming down the Matt inside. Frey. yeah. And Brunel had elected to go out to go around uh, an exclusion zone where most of the rest of the fleet want. Then it got night time. And then we had our last sked as we went into night time. And Matt Frey jibes out to miss, avoid the shoals. And Dong Fong doesn't. Dong Fong goes straight over the shoals, right? And uh, when the next sked, you could see six hours later, the Matt Frey is just going, oh, shit. They've gone through. If we follow them, we can't beat them. So they had to go out and, and they had to head west and go around the exclusion zone. So, I believe it was Murd. Murd. Uh, uh, that's French. <laughs> Sorry. That, so that uh, whole, Spanish, please, BP. <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, Puta madre. <laughs> the whole thing, I reckon, came down to the, the Dutch influence, uh, that knowledge, that the whole race, that last yeah. night. Well, that, 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 that's the question I asked. I mean, obviously – well, okay, let's let's just go one step back. I mean, when when you you talked about it early earlier on the piece, so you'd planned to do this particular manoeuvre if the weather panned out. Um, do do you sort of like feel particularly proud that obviously that's from your where you're from, but you feel particularly proud that you actually had input in that critical decision because it's a massive decision in the in the scheme of things. It's a huge decision, and um, I think, you know, I fully take my hats off to uh, Pascal and Charles. In the end, you know, uh, well, and, they are the ones and we, that and we to... take our And we take our hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I give them full credit, and, uh, and uh, also Marcel. Um, I, you know, Pascal 
uh, and rightly so, understandably so, was quite nervous. Uh, we all <laughs> we all were going into that last leg, and as to you know, it's a it's a big decision to take. Also, you know, we've been going around the world for over eight months, and. I was always telling everyone, oh, this is such a cool race. You know, you, you're off watch and you come on deck for your four hours watching. Um, you come on deck and you look around and you see at least one or two boats around you. And, you know, that's how close racing was going around the world. I mm. mean, we had um, a port starboard with map fray in the southern ocean you know <laughs> mo re most remote place in the world where did you did um, you uh, at the end of that leg did you get in the bar and do a bit of bar karate and talk about it <laughs> over a beer or two and there you go yeah M more than one or two of course i was on port <laughs> yeah, they were on starboard here we go yeah. that's pretty cool but and then and then you get to the last leg of the of the race where it's probably most important that you are able to see each other and it's the one leg that's the most complicated because it's got all these exclusion zones and, you know, we get split and, mm -hmm. um, and you don't see each other until 12 miles before the finish. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it, it was a, a crucial and, and that's why I think we, we definitely did, you know, study, uh, this last leg better than than ever you know i think we were pretty well prepared for all the legs but this one you know we studied better than ever and i think pascal did um obviously with marcel being dutch and maybe having a little bit of his more local knowledge um seek a little bit more guidance um from marcel but in the end um it is pascal and charles decision once you're out there on the water, you know, once you leave the dock, um, it's up to uh, us on the boat to uh, to take the decisions. And, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty gutsy move to make. And if you look at the tracker as well, we um, once we'd chosen to go uh, the inside route, um, we actually have to do uh, two small jibes because um, we got our ley lines wrong and um, we had to jibe away for a, a, a sandbank. And um, it uh, cost us eight minutes. And we remember saying to each other at the time, it was middle of the night, and we remember saying to each other at the time, like, these eight minutes could be very, very costly because it could mm. possibly cost us the race. Crazy. And, uh, well, the well, end it didn't, but well, if, um, got pretty close. Well, if Pasquale and Charles um, felt under pressure, I mean, at times there, there was one million people on the tracker watching what was going on. So from a shore side point of view, there was some extremely nervous people and just fans watching the race. And I'll never forget, actually, um, just the boats coming in that day and you guys and everyone following and um, your people, whoever was renting your apartment at the time, giving you away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's epic. It's huge. You know, I think for... For Holland, as a as a as a small nation, but um, a small sailing nation, I think it, it was huge. You know what's um, the uh, the amount of people that came to to this to the Hague to watch the finish of the Volvo, and during the whole last week, uh, also for the uh, for the last import race, um, it's huge. It's unheard of. There's never been that many people come together. Uh, for uh, for a sports event, for a sailing event um, in Holland, and I, I think yeah, it was uh, both good good for sailing, but also um, for for Holland as a nation. Definitely, yeah. The Dutch are mad for the event, aren't they? They they get behind it in a big way. So with that in mind, you guys then rolled on to try and create an America's Cup team. No success, but how close did you get to getting the funds? I think we 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 got a lot closer than we ever realized we would or than we expected uh, we would and you know the reason to there was a couple of reasons to to start this Olympic the the America's Cup campaign um, for Holland at this time obviously coming you know having had such a successful finish in The Hague um, for um, De Haag as a city, uh, uh, or and uh, Schevening as a, as a town, and De Haag as a city, and um, and Holland, um, sailing was quite hot, you know, as as a sport, and we were number one, or still are, I believe, 
as a nation in Olympic sailing as well, um, scoring very well there. Um, and on top of that, uh, the America's Cup being in the hands of the Kiwis, uh, it was the, we use the Kiwis as, a, as an example. Um, in Holland, we don't have the, the culture of, you know, um, uh, one person with a lot of money um, funding a, a full campaign. We don't, we, we, we are not like that in Holland. And, and it's a bit the way the Kiwis are doing. You have to get the local government behind you. You have to get the local industry behind you. You know, you have to get the people in the country behind you. And that's the way that we wanted to do it in Holland as well. Or it's the only way that we could potentially do it in Holland. So timing wise, it was the perfect time to do it. Um, with the finish uh, and, you know, scoring so well in Olympic sailing. Um, so we did create a lot of momentum. But unfortunately, um, an America's com campaign is um, at least four times a uh, um, Volvo Ocean Race or Ocean Race uh, mm, uh, project. And uh, we only really had um, six months, um, max eight months, um, to be honest. And uh, to we we got a lot of support, and um, I think we got a lot closer than we ever realised. It was always going to be an ambitious plan, but it was the right moment to to give it a go. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully um, uh, next time um, the momentum is still there uh, to uh, to pick it up again and uh, and to keep going. But. Um, in a way, yeah, it was a, it was a huge disappointment, especially when yeah you realise how close you actually were to uh, well, to getting the green light. Well, um, maybe Caroline, you can take some of that experience and uh, with you and your de facto husband, apply <laughs> that to an Australian campaign at some point in time. Well, well, <laughs> well, this is where it's going. I was going to ask you the question. Can you actually now, having represented um, Holland and then also Belgium, can you now represent a third country in the Olympics? I'm making a plan here. <laughs> oh, I see where Boston, uh, I see, where you've oh, I see what's going can, on here. Can you represent a third Holy country? Yes. I believe you can. Are you about to... That's you're about to announce something, no more talk. No more, no more talk. No more talk. Move on. You're about next to question. announce something, Caroline. Uh, next, question, next question, please. Move on, please. As of now, okay, move well, on. The, the next question is, what's next for you, Caroline? <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt that one coming. This, this led to another thing, actually, which the future plans I saw here and uh, the future plans. And I didn't realise you lived on the lake. So your future plans is you're going to meet me next week in uh, in Toronto and come for a sale on the X with me. Oh, is that so? Well, I'd be happy <laughs> at, the, uh, <laughs> at the Sports Boat Nationals. <laughs> hey, so, sounds not, sounds not? like great fun. We've got another cloggy on the boat on on board. Oh, interesting. Actually, she uh, her name's Rulin. She's uh, she's just uh, just to give you a little bit of information, guys. She uh, sailed back on InfoTrack with us, and uh, she's a young twenty six year old uh, girl from Holland who's come over, and she just got a job with uh, McConaughey's as a naval architect. There you right, go. Right, right, right. Mm, the Dutch challenge. So, uh, what was her name again? Rulin Westerland or Wester something. Anyway, I don't know her last name, but uh, we call her Ru. That's okay. Cool. Yeah. Should probably Absolutely know her, but it doesn't ring a bell. But uh, to come back to uh, your question, no, I am not doing an Olympic campaign uh. with my husband for Australia. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't hinting that. Well, you're not old enough for starters. Um, Double-handed <laughs> offshore. When you look at it. Karen, I, I wasn't hinting doing a uh, doing but, uh, an Olympic campaign with your husband. Uh, I wasn't yeah. hinting the uh, mixed uh, mixed <laughs> offshore though. I was hinting uh, the NACRA seventeen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, BP's very, gone completely. He's gone the double handed <laughs> mixed offshore. <event. laughs> and he's not thinking about your husband at all. I can assure you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the recruit. Um, no. All right. Well, that's cool. Oh, actually, before we sort of roll on to the uh, to a bit of discussion stuff, the the obvious question I have for you: which is more uh, painful? <laughs> Southern Ocean uh, in the Volvo Ocean Race or just going for a sail in a laser radial? <laughs> <laughs> that is a cracking question. I love that question. Oh, which one's more scary downwind? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to answer? That's fair enough. More, 
m- more painful is uh, hiking in a laser radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, actually, uh, more scary. I, I don't know. The Southern Ocean, you know, it has its moments, um, and definitely uh, you have moments um, that uh, you're under a lot of uh, tension and uh, yeah. the nerves are high. And sure, there's a few scary moments, but. Um, I never felt in the Southern Ocean, um, especially with uh, Dongfeng, that um, we were we were out of control and um, always had uh, very very reliable uh, people on the helm and uh, people that we we could really trust and that we knew that would do a good job in uh, in those extreme conditions. And also, I I take my hat off for for Charles. You know, it's a Wow. It's a very, very tough leg, and um, it's very easy in a way to make these boats go very fast and to push these boats uh, very hard, especially when you're racing so close to each other. Everyone's pushing the boats to to the limits, but um, it takes a really good um, skipper to tell his crew to actually slow down, slow the boat down, and uh, take the foot off the gas. Um, I think that's probably a harder thing to tell your crew, um, especially when the competition's just around you, uh, pushing just as hard, uh, is to tell your crew to uh, to actually slow down a little um, than to uh, to send the boat um, off the waves or send it as hard as you can. So, and I think um, Charles did a really good job uh, in finding the balance uh, between when do we go for it and send it and push the boats to its limits and the crew to its limits. And uh, when is it time to just back off that little bit um, when the situation or the conditions get um, uh, too uh, unsafe to um, to to be safe, uh, boat and crew? So, yeah, I think uh, we manage that quite well. I, I, have a, I have a question for you, Caroline. And I, I, we know we've all been sort of sailing in, you know, relatively tough conditions and obviously uh, you doing the Volvo. Um, when you when you're down there and, and this is mainly for the listeners, uh, when you're down there in that in the harshest conditions, let's talk about the, the harshest conditions you're in, and it eases off. The feeling of of tension release is it's it's a really cool release. Could you could you feel or could you ex- also explain to the listeners what it feels like when the when the system passes through and you feel the boat starting to get back into control and you start going up in sail and uh, that, that that's a good a question I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, you know, it, I guess it's a feeling of of relief. Uh, but at the same time, we you never stop. You know, you never uh, give in too much because uh, when the system passes, or you know, you're going to get a few hours of a little bit of relief, a little bit of less wind. Um, then you're already thinking, oh, we need to do. We need to put up bigger sails. Do we need to shake a reef? You know, you're always thinking what is the next step or how can we get that point one or point two of a knot um, out of the boat or uh, sometimes it's a very difficult situation to be in at the same time because you get that little bit of relief but how long is it going to take you know is it are we going to have another school in 30 minutes is it worth um, putting a, a, a different sail up or shaking the reef or shall we just you know keep uh, sailing the boats as we are now in a little bit more of a safe mode. Um, And so you're constantly um, asking yourself that question and you're constantly thinking about the next move. So you you release tension because maybe the conditions are a little bit easier, but, you know, as soon as you put up a bigger sail, um, you're you're back back in tension. (laughs) You're you're taking off uh, off again, so yeah. um, and that that balance is um, is 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 quite hard to to find, and uh, yeah, it it takes a lot of energy to constantly be be thinking about um, the next move and um, and and what is what is our next best move. It's very easy to get caught in safe mode. You're saying. Yeah, exactly, and you, you know it's it's. Um, I, we said to each other before every before every southern southern ocean leg, um, you know, I, I, in a, any other leg, our priority was always to to win, to try and win the leg. We only managed to do it in the last leg of the race, but still, the goal was always there to win the leg. Uh, but for the southern ocean legs, uh, you know, safety was number one, and winning um, came second. 
And that's something that we all had in our heads and we had to keep reminding ourselves of it as well. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes we did choose to stay in the safe mode, but it does make you nervous because you're thinking, well, what if the opposition hasn't done that? And, you know, uh, are we losing out? Should we be pushing more? So, um, and yeah, it, so you constantly, your body is under uh, tension in, um, in those parts of the world. So I guess before we roll on to discussion points, Carolyn, I have to ask one question. Have you been sailing in an Imoka 60? Not yet. Oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> Good answer. We know, we'll no, been, get you back uh, on soon for the, uh, <laughs> what it was like. <laughs> I'm going to have to put my programs together pretty quick. <laughs> no, you know, there's one thing about um, the next ocean race. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I've, been, I've done two, uh, people say three, but I consider it two and a half maybe. The first one uh, wasn't a full one. But, um, you know, it's, it's got to be a challenge. Uh, it's a huge commitment, um, especially now also having a family. So, um, you know, you do, it's a huge responsibility. Um, so, but it has to be uh, a challenge for me. So, you know, Team SEA was a huge challenge going around the world with a girl's boat and, you know, trying to put women sailing back on the map. And, um, and then with, with Dong Feng having the goal to win the race, uh, both huge challenges. So, you know, if I consider doing the, the race again, um, for me, you know, if Charles would ring tomorrow and say, listen, uh, we want to go around the world again and um, I'm going to try and win in this, this again, there's, th that doesn't do it for me. You know, I've, I've ticked that box. So for me, it has to be a challenge. And obviously introducing the, the Imokas, um, that, that's a, a different world again, mm. you know. I'm going to be going around the world mm. on foil, so I'm going, going to be going around the world faster. Uh, mm. There's a lot to learn, um, so that, that makes it uh, very challenging. Um, at the same time, um, I, I still want it to be competitive, you know. If you're going to have eight um, Volvo 65s going around the world, that's going to be a pretty cool fleet. Um, I don't know how many um, Imokas are being built at the moment but it's not that many and um i wouldn't really want to be going around the world with just two three boats so okay. um i really hope that you know that is going to change in in the near future all right well we won't answer any of those things that you just raised <laughs> stay tuned stay the tuned secret pro <laughs> straight <laughs> through the shredder that, 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 that goddamn secret pro okay right. baseline 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 all right, team. So discussion points. The first discussion point, I thought uh, I would have to touch on the Magenta Project. Um, they have announced they're joining forces with Sunsail, which is a leading yacht charter company. So they're forming a, a, a group called Sunsail Magenta and will deliver a number of sailing activities, including women's only uh, RYA sailing courses, race training courses, career opportunities and mentoring programs uh, throughout the UK. What do we think? Well, uh, as an incentive to try and get more women involved, if this get gets uh, more women out in the water, it's a fantastic thing. Um, really? As um, on the other side... Uh, yachting, I think, is quite inclusive anyway. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure um, exactly um, the the correct answer, but if this is the answer, I think it's a it's a great thing. Um, are you involved uh, on a day to day basis at all with the Magenta Project, Caroline? I'm not involved um, in a day to day basis. Uh, there mainly based in the in the UK but uh, where I do uh, try and help out is um, in their mentoring program and their mentoring yeah. scheme and I think that's been uh, very successful so last year was the first time and um, we did an evaluation um, at the end of the of the year and uh, it was quite it 
because it was so successful, um, it um, did a, a second season, so another one this year. And I, uh, I was a mentor to uh, a Dutch girl uh, last year and uh, to an Australian girl because I'm trying to base myself here a little bit more um, this year. But it's, um, it's really cool to see how these uh, young girls are, um, uh, how we can help them create uh, opportunities for them to um to get into um sailing at a at a higher level you know depending on their their goals um so um the dutch girl i uh, i mentored last year her goal is she wants to sail the um the the ocean race she wants to be part of the ocean race and um so you know we've I help her setting up um, her uh, her program for the year, and you know it's 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 hard enough for us. So you don't want um, uh, one of your mentees to come to you and just ask you for oh can you uh, set me up uh, with yeah. uh, a boat and uh, you know get me onto yeah. a boat so uh, so I can sail the race. You know it's not that simple. <laughs> Um, it's hard for us uh, to 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 get gigs on boats as well. But um, what you're trying to help them with is obviously you try to put them in contact. And I think you know the setup for the Volvo 65s uh, for the next race is is quite good where it comes to uh, when it comes to the under 30s. So uh, that gives them um, um, most of the girls are are around the uh, the age of 23 to 26. So that gives them a good opportunity. Um, so you try to put them in contact, but you you help them with is just how how to approach you know it's it's a huge process and and uh having the experience myself um that you can uh, guide them and uh, give them tips and give them advice um as to you know obviously that's your end goal but it's it's very far away so you know you try and split it up in a, a few um um, sub goals and um, and you know uh, where they're all they think about is uh, I need to go sailing 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 um, but you know have you thought about doing your yacht masters for example you know so there's a lot of things where um, that, that they haven't thought about and uh, uh, what we're trying to um, give to them as well is the uh, opportunity to try uh, different areas in the marine industry. You know how you always have to have, uh, uh, if you are you get onto a boat, uh, or another responsibility or an area of responsibility, whether it's sailmaking or being a rigger or, or even in the performance side of things or navigation or whatever it is. Um, that they have to have those skills as well or another set of skills. And um, so we try and guide them through the, the, the process, you know, help them, help them along in their journey. And, um, and yeah, if I look back at um, – I've only just started working with, with Claire, the, the Australian girl, but if I look back at, at the, the work we did uh, with Ariana, and that's been hugely successful. And, you know, she's managed to, uh, to get quite a few offshore miles under her belt and, um, and uh, did the Sydney to Hobart uh, last year. And um, I just got her yacht masters in Palma as well. So you know she's she's ticking along, and 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 the process that she's going through um, seems to be working really well for her. And you know that's a it's a way for me to sort of give back um, to uh, to the sailing world. And in a way, it's not just um, the young girls. You know, there's plenty of the 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 youth guys as well that are that are trying to make their way into big boat sailing into offshore sailing that that come for um for for tips and advice as well and yeah i i enjoy that part of it where you can help out and uh, and uh, and give back to uh, to the next gen- generation hey um fellas one for mm. you two guys mm. how do you think the bar karate mentor project would go Go great. Yeah, they go great. We well, create a real community. It might, it might conflict with my magenta program. <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually mentoring. <laughs> well, I'm a fan of the magenta project. I, I, me I, too. Absolutely. Me too. Yep. Me yep. too. Yeah. I, I think, you know, anything that gets more women into Hashtag. our sport is a great thing. Bice has lost it. <laughs> He's gone. Yep. So He's I'm going to his perch. He's fell off his perch. Sorry. I'm going to just jump in. But a I couple think of... the Bar Karate Mentor Program would be awesome. Uh, I think it would be too. We'll start it up. Um, I'll, just, I'll jump a couple of topics just because this tops and tails nicely with what you've just said, Caroline. 
So, first off, uh, Mirapuri Foundation, their racing team, has announced um, Johan Richom as the skipper of their Volvo 65 for the 21-22 edition of the Ocean Race. What do we think of that? Awesome. Ah, awesome. Right. Yep. Did uh, Bruno have much to do with that, you reckon? Yep. 100%. <laughs> Bruno and Charles. Um, I think both Bruno and Charles, correct. Exactly. Yes. So... Uh, but uh, I don't think anyone could argue with the quality coming out of France, um, for, especially from an ocean racing point of view. And from the sounds of it, um, the the CV that is attached with the R is uh, very, very good. So I think he will be extremely successful. Yeah, so he's won the Solitaire de Figaro twice, uh, won the Route de Rum, um, and that's all quite recent. He is based in Lorient. Um, Bossy, I might go to Lorient in a week or two just to catch up with him. What do you reckon? Good idea. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing I know the travel agent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I've got a trip booked uh, to Lorient in a week or two. So, uh, Jan, if you're out there, just... Well, actually, the thing he's done is... And we'll put it up on our Facebook page. He's, he's got the call out for crew. So, if well, you this- are... I was just looking at this. I was just I yep. was going to jump in and say something, but go, go on. on. No, you go, go Beeper. Well, I'm sort of at the a bit of log ends here because uh, you know the King of Challenge is struggling. <laughs> oh, we haven't really tried yet. Let's, let's not put let's the King just, of Challenge. Let's, let's just let's put the King of Challenge in there and, and supply the crew for him. I mean, we could do it. Oh, I see where you're going. Oh, I see where you're going. But uh, look, we'll just be serious for one second. Her- Given what Caroline's just been talking we've been about. Very seri- we've been very serious all night. I know, I know. But for the Mentor Program, this, this is important for the listeners. There's a few people, I mean, given the number of emails we get about this, Johan Richard has put out the call to send your CVs in. So if you go on to the Mirapuri Foundation Racing Team uh, on Facebook or on find their website or go to Johan and, and he's looking for sailors. He's, he's looking for... A lot of the things Caroline just talked about and what they talk about in their mentoring program. So if you are at all interested, it's the first boat that is announced that's officially doing the race. It'll be on a 65, which is the perfect boat to go around on mm. your first time. Um, so there's your chance, all right? So I guess that's what I was trying to lead to, all right? So yeah. Yeah, um, good one. A great team. So it's backed by uh, Bruno and and Charles, who Charles. were the two guys behind the winning team, which Caroline sailed on last time. So it's a it's a, a really solid campaign. So a good opportunity for any punters out there. Is that, is that cool? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I think just to add, uh, you know, having sailed with um, with Frenchies, uh, quite a lot of them in the, in the last race, um, and having been based in Lorient for about eight months uh, prior to uh, <laughs> to the race, I you really learn to appreciate the the French offshore culture. Um, yeah, well, it's huge. It's mainly huge. in Brittany, it is absolutely huge. I and, agree with um, you. You know, I I take my hats off for all the people that sail single-handed around the world and uh, and do the Figaro. Um, I'm I'm not that type of person, but when, once you live there and you feel the vibe and and the culture that they have, it's it's addictive. Uh, it's it's very impressive. And uh, well, I I guess that's why you know probably the best offshore sailors um, in the world. Um, a lot of them come come from that area, come from uh, from France. It's, uh, I, I, it's I love I love the base. I love Lorient. I just, the base itself is just a it's a an amazing that, place that, to go to. That's a bar, mate. <laughs> oh the you bar. Get a out of the bar La Basse. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about yeah, We all oh, love okay. that joint. Right? Yeah, We're talking on. about yachting. <laughs> come on. Come on. If you, if you I, look just, at... I just love walk I love walking in those uh, the sheds that Hitler built to uh, to, to, to build the submarines <laughs> and and you look in there and there's all these little minis in there. Yeah. You know? Okay. Love it. Love it. Okay. Love Lorient. Well, yep. All right. Uh, well let's swap on to Sail GP news. There's a bit to talk about here. Obviously, the big one is the, mm. the sale of part of the, the event. Um, so uh, a group called Endeavour Group Holdings, which is effectively an agency company. They're agents for sports, they're agents for um, movie stars. They're a massive company worldwide now. There's so much cash behind them, and they've bought in to sale GP, and they do a lot of media and media sales. 
ex so, uh, IMG, right? Uh, they bought, bought IMG. Off. They bought yeah, IMG. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the important thing is that you know they're a content provider. They produce content for all the major yep. um, major media houses. So there's two good things about this. One, what they raised in the media, where it values uh, the sale GP at two hundred million dollars, but given the price they paid for the percentage of share. But then two, they've got um, a perfect door opener for selling their product out to this product out to the world. Sale GP, it's a big one. It's really exciting. They've done a really good job. Is Russell Coots a genius or uh, Larry a genius or is it uh, the we, we probably know. We probably know Larry's a genius. Uh, Russell Coots, uh, I mean, I'd love to have him on the show. I would love to talk to him about it all. But, you know, I think my, my yeah. point is my point is that uh, the, the this particular project or you know, the sale GP is giving the – non-traditional viewer or non-traditional uh, interest of, of to, to, to non-interested sailors. They, they, they're seeing this and it's just opening a whole new bunch of doors up. And that's what I love about it. I, I'm going to comment on that, opening the doors up. But one, the $200 million, that's about a third of what Larry spent on his last America's Cup campaign. Yeah, sure. So if you want to put it just to have a look, weigh things up. But, well... I, I could be wrong a little, but then you look down the list of that press release that came out and this same company who um, became the part owner of the ultimate fight championship for yeah. $4 billion. Yeah. Yeah. So my oh, proposal, oh, I know where you're going. we actually put a Another. fence around the <laughs> Sal GP course and it's like the ultimate robot challenge. Because you can go anywhere. <laughs> and and just... it, it's a full on, yep. Yeah, but just it's got everywhere. A proper starbins. Yeah. <laughs> so you were calling for the increased, much better sledging to come from this event. Oh, uh, you absolutely. Need, much better so sledging and closer lee bows. Okay, <laughs> and that will that will grow More the value crashes. of the event. Yeah, yeah. I see where we're and going. Then, oh. then we're so, talking real money. Hang on, you're oh. you're going down demolition derby derby path. Well, yeah. You okay. want viewers. That'll get viewers. Well, here's oh, the uh, let's. You only got to go to Speedway Park, Speedway Park, and watch the cra- cars crash into each other. Mm. Is something like this already happening behind the scenes? No. Oh. Because did you see the move in lineup? But the British team has added Goobs and Parco, and they've moved over from Team Japan. So Ian Jensen and Parco. Have jumped ship, left Nath. Well, yeah, but they're part of the cup team, right? So they're taking <sighs> a little bit of the double dip, okay. the cup and uh, the sale GP. I'm trying to start but, a like. But this what a... I am trying to say is, if you're going to have a punch up, I wouldn't mind Parker on my team. Just <laughs> <laughs> Parker and Slingsby one on one. That'd be a tough one, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, that would. Yeah. Be, that might be the final <laughs> right there. <laughs> Uh, uh, actually, Caroline, how would you go on a punch up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we're waiting for the answer. <laughs> uh, not too bad, I don't think. We had a bit of practice on Dong Feng, so yeah, I'm yeah. good. <laughs> I actually, I reckon I do tell, do tell, do tell. No, no, well, no, no, no. no, 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 no only jokes, only jokes. That way, oh, I'd back you, Caroline. I absolutely would. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. You know, if I can throw in, uh, they've just uh, removed the uh, only um, woman that was on the CLGP is uh, no Larry. longer on the CLGP yeah, for yeah, Team yeah. France. So yeah. um, you know, it's quite disappointing in a way. But that was Bruno's yep. fault. So have you rung him? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm no, not... I haven't spoken to Bruno about that, actually. Okay. Let's not get you in <laughs> but, trouble. Uh, because... I, 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 I hope he didn't have too much to do with that, but look, I, I think I think I think you'll see this this particular dis, this particular discipline of the sport will grow. I think that it's going to keep going for a little bit longer. Or, uh, you know, we'll see what happens over the coming years. But I think that uh, there's a lot of interest in it, and um, I think that it'll it'll take its own natural path, and we'll see a lot more women back on on those boats. The one thing I do need to say to uh, the organisers of Sail GP because I know they listen. Because I've been and talking. This is direct. This is directly to them. Direct is it? to them. All three members of Bar Karate are expected to be at the Sydney event. 
and we haven't yeah, bought well, that's tickets. Gonna be, that's going to be very difficult, Jay Dog. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, oh, you're racing. There's something, there's something bigger and better than Sale GP. Oh, you're off doing your, your nationals. The, no, the T the T cool, uh, nah, nah, Racing we, Week. We got time, mate. Oh, we got we? time. We finish Thursday. We fly on Sydney uh, Friday. All right, then I'll fly back and then take the, take take my boat back to Adelaide. From Lincoln. Yeah, okay, yeah. we can do uh, that. Okay. By anyway. the way, just uh, don't tell my wife. Yep. <laughs> um, but hey, anyway, do, so me a favor, do me a favour and don't tell mine either. <laughs> the organisers of the Sale GP. Oh, shit. The, Hang on, I live in Sydney. Hey, BP, I'm trying to pitch you some money here, mate. <laughs> the organisers of the Sale GP, the, the Barkerati crew will be there to, uh, to help. Just let us through the doors. We'll be there to make your life better. So... And uh, Caroline, will you be heading down to uh, watch a bit of the Sale GP? What do you think yes, of it? Yes, I will. I, w- I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Excellent. Um, it's yeah. I think I was here um, for the uh, first event last year in Sydney, and uh, and it was great. And I was in uh, in New York, so um, uh, I, I think it's awesome. And I think uh, where it's going and. Uh, um, the the people that it's uh, that it's attracting and you know I I hope the um, the racing will be a bit closer I think you always have the the gap uh, between the Aussies being really strong and um, well Nathan with Sail Japan might struggle a little bit more this year um, having lost uh, two of his main uh, crew Thank members yeah. um, but then again you get Ben Ainsley back for that with his crew, mm. so he'll uh, definitely, even being new to the to the Cell GP, will be very very strong. But it'd be nice to see the uh, the other teams, the upcoming teams, um, you know, giving them a run for their money as well. Um, but I think the concept is great. Um, I think it. Uh, I think Brett mentioned it before. It attracts uh, a lot of non sailing fans as well and I, I think that's good and I think now um, having um, Endeavour um, involved um, is only you know going to get bigger bigger from here um, I think they've achieved quite a lot um, in their first season it's only the second season so mm. yeah I uh, I think we can uh, we can expect a lot from it and just you know even talking to non um, sailing friends um, here around our area uh, they've all heard about it, and uh, they're all keen to uh, to watch it, to go and watch it, or 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 watch it on the screen if they can. But um, yeah, I think it's uh, gaining in popularity and definitely um, heading in the right direction. It's um, yeah, new era for sailing. I I was um, just reading up on it a little bit the other day, and I think the boats might even be a bit closer this year, gi- yep. given that the control systems have been what they were learnt last year have been not simplified but make the boat easier to sail. Numb. So that may bring the boats closer together mm. um, as opposed to um, last year it was kind of seat of your pants <laughs> almost um, and now it has, like you say, been numbed out. Dumbed, not dumbed, uh, definitely numb, not dumbed numb, down. Numb, numbed, but, um, numbed is a good maybe word. Maybe a bit, bit closer. So cool. let's uh, stand by. Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. We're all happy? We're all happy. Uh, Caroline, you happy? Very happy. Oh, good. Let's go back to grassroots. I've got an email from a bloke called David Buckley, and I want to read this email word for word um, because it raised some interesting points. I don't know if we'll say anything. Just the the email speaks for itself. He writes, hi, guys. Congrats on the podcast. It's filling my days beautifully, particularly, particularly since our lake has gone dry and the club has led had to suspend racing all summer and other clubs think they have problems. We have a tin shed with no water on the side of an almost dry blue-green algae infested lake. No youth match racing here. It has been interesting to listen to all the talk about getting people into sailing. Just wanted to share my son's experience as a rural sailor. We went to a fair few regattas and youth regattas and whilst the sailing and experience was awesome socially, I have to say it was all a bit alienating. Sabos aside, they were awesome. We generally would go only to regattas outside of Sydney and Melbourne as the accommodation makes it outrageously expensive. Anything on the Sydney Harbour is out. Lake Macquarie and Illawarra are heaps better. In Melbourne, down the bay is good, but as we can camp on the foreshore. 
Having youth regattas in major centres in peak summer rules us out. The cost of accommodation is prohibitive. That aside, when he gets there, the kids almost invariably come from Royal somewhere or other squad with coaches, coach boats and the works. I may have sold my boy a little short by only providing him with an old hull, a drink bottle and a muesli bar in his buoyancy vest for between races. Uh, that's what we had and I thought it was de rigueur. The other kids go to their coach boat and get lunch, a debrief from the coach and discuss conditions with Ed Wright or some other star sailor and then get towed in after the race. In any case, my son now counts the lack of coach boat and making his own decisions as a source of pride, having, ne- having never actually been towed in. He is proud of that too. On water, coaching should be banned. It's one of the beauties of our sport. The absence of sideline parents and kids, sailors making their own decisions should be what happens. Socially, sailing is a bit less gregarious compared to my day. Now the kids all go off their debriefing, have pre-race sessions and reside in their royal squad groups with coloured garments to signal as such. This is in marked contrast to his other sport of gravity mountain bike racing, which I assume is downhill mountain bike racing, or, or do you just mm-hmm. throw it out of a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> where, Don't have to worry about the coloured shirt there. <laughs> where they are all individuals and no squads, and they all get to know each other before and after the racing and hang out at the camp ground at night. There you can win the worlds on a bike that costs less than five grand. Um, in sailing, they all go back to their hotels after being with their coaches. This is no drama, but the sport will contract to a group of kids from Royal somewhere, with little rural and regional kids becoming a curiosity. They have disappeared along with the rural clubs. If they want the remaining rural and regional kids to feel part of, billet- part of it, billeting or some sort of inclusion system is required. It's, going to the tour- it's like going to the Tour de France as an individual amongst all the race teams. My time with kids is now over and my beloved sport will soon disappear from rural areas. We pay large fees to Yachting Australia or whoever, uh, or whoever and it is almost of no value whatsoever. The NRL, AFL and soccer all have regional development managers to help but sailing is focused on the Olympic team and kids at Royal Somewhere Clubs. They need freshwater cups or inland trophies for the kids from the bush mm. so they have some chance. As a PS, he said... Please do not try and talk about getting on the turp so much in the podcast. A few drinks and a beer is all fun and we need more fun and socialising in the sport, but too much talk reminds me of the rugby league footy show or schoolies. So David Buckley, who is a senior health statistician, so fair enough, David. Um, we're not as bad as we make out. We just we like the humour of it. But a really powerful email. Mm, um, massive, massive email. Powerful because... What he's saying, his key point, I think, drop the coach boats up to a certain age, which is what Adrian said, just have more fun up to a certain age. And what uh, Santi said the same, didn't he? Was it Santi or, or was it? Yeah, um, Santi. Yeah, Santi, sure. Santi said it, yep. Santi yeah. said it, yep. Interesting. I don't know if we can say anything. Is that too long or? I was just, I wanted to read it out. It's a big, it's a big one. Um, it is a big one and we've all read it and probably had time to absorb it a little bit. But mm. Caroline, can I ask you, when you heard that, what, what, what's that kind of uh, make you feel, actually? Well, I think it is a bit of a problem um, everywhere in the world. I, I see it in Holland as well, you know, where um, especially in the optimist class, um, where sometimes it seems like it's more about the parents than about the kids uh, themselves. And I think that's really dangerous. Um, I do uh, have to agree that, you know, it's about, it's all about the fun. Um, I have an eight-year-old son who I'd love to get into sailing, but currently he hates sailing, so (laughs) I I don't have the problem for a while. No no, no pressure though, yeah. (laughs) and, 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 And also I... I want to keep sailing myself on the weekends, so um, there's no time to sit in a coach boat and watch him sail. Um, but I do believe if you look at uh, other sports and compare other sports, because um, that's what we generally do, um, soccer, for example, they start grading the kids at too young an age as well. It starts getting too serious, um, mm. in my opinion, at too uh, early stage um whereas for example when you look at hockey 
they will start grading or selecting kids uh, into squads um, at a much later age, let's say maybe 13, whereas in soccer it starts at eight. And yeah, sure. to me, you know, for my son, um, he has two very competitive parents, but he's not competitive at all. You know, for him, it, it's all about the fun that he has with his mates and his social interaction with, with other kids his age. And that's the most important thing, you know, that they are moving, that they are, um, you know, getting the, the physical movement that, that, that every person or every child needs uh, nowadays uh, and having fun uh, while doing it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's so important still uh, at our age, you know, look at, look at our own um, sailing careers and we, we don't, I don't do anything. Of course, there's times where, where I wish it, it was different, but in general, um, over the uh, the course of, of projects or anything I've done in my sailing, I've done it because it's loads of fun. And that is the most important thing. So that should be the most important thing for the young kids that are just starting um, uh, a new sport or um, developing in, in some sort of um, – uh, it, it, developing in something. And I, I, I tend to agree, you know, if you can have the option of – if you send all these kids to all the same events where, you know, you have the, the, the Benjamin, the beginners, um, um, with the, uh, the, the top sailors, the sailors that have, um, have evolved and, uh, developed, uh, into maybe with, probably with the help of parents and, and coaches and facilities, um, I think it isn't an option for it to just have more local club sailing or regional or just to – and different uh, divisions or groups where you get these kids that um, don't have the means or don't want to um, grow into uh, an Olympic sailor, may, probably don't even know it at that age, but just uh, do it for the fun of it. Um, and uh, I think that that should be encouraged and there's not enough of it um, mm. around. If I look at my own area, um, there's definitely not uh, around. I, I Lake Macquarie, you know, um, you would want every child that lives around the lake to be able to at least get in touch with sailing and try sailing um, because you live, um, you know, along a stretch of water, probably one of the most beautiful in the world. But a lot of kids that live around that area don't even have anything to do with water sports, which um, which is ridiculous because but you would all... Still, but it still has produced some of the best sailors in the world in the last uh, 10, 15 years. I mean, that's important to think as well. Yes, so so that's why I think you should have those different levels, um, and and there's nothing wrong with that. So what I understood from 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 this Dave guy is that yeah he to to introduce more regional events um, yeah, think- for for those kids, uh, which will make them happy, and then you know the the kids that that want to progress that at that young age already know what they want and have that ambition. Um, they also have their opportunity to uh, I, to keep growing. I think the answer is to actually have uh, the as he as he says the royal somewheres. <laughs> now I love I love the way he said that the royal somewheres to take to actually send them out to these to these events and to go and do uh, these uh, these events in the lakes and go out and sail them and see how they go out there without coaches and just just make them interact with the the people out there. Mm. I'm not sure you can make anyone do uh, it. All, uh, what I've got to say there is uh, two things. Uh, one, David, for the PS, I apologise. Um, <laughs> two, um, we don't have the answer yet, but I really believe, and I truly believe this, um, we've certainly sparked enough debate, not only Ooh. nationally but globally, in Massive relation debate. to this. And um, I really would like to take this as we build and our listener base builds to kind of take this to the next level and hopefully we can take it to the different um, 
different bodies that that are in charge of these things and give them real feedback. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what we will definitely endeavour to do. So appreciate the uh, the feedback, David, and um, we'll, uh, we're on your side, mate. So I guess the, here, here. the one thing he's trying to say is Australian sailing not to forget about the country clubs. Make sure you get something oh, I, out there. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's the big. I think it's the key point in this email. Absolutely. Um, and I will say on that that PS, I, I actually don't drink alcohol unless I'm with Nick Boss. Um, <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm with Nick Boss a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. So that was a good email. Actually, we got another one. So we did actually say if there were some clubs out there doing something different, let us know on this fun thing because what what you just said, Caroline, and what everyone's been saying. So we've got a couple of emails. One is from Brett Chivers, who has absolutely taken – we hear from Brett a lot. He loves bar karate. And good on you, bud. We appreciate it. He, um, he actually sent us an email. He said he's been out of sailing for the past 20 years and listening to bar karate has inspired him to go and get a laser and get back on the water. Yes. And Fantastic. his 12-year-old daughter's also stuck her hand up to go sailing as well. So that's one good thing. Um, go he, bar karate, Go. He's originally from Guam, and they have an annual regatta there in March or April every year, the Guam-Japan Goodwill Regatta. And he says it's a lot of fun, a lot of double hand, a lot of dinghy sailing, double-handed lasers and stuff for the younger kids, always a barbecue each night. So if you're interested and uh, you want to head over to Guam, that sounds like a cool one. If you guys, uh, anyone's got a trip to Guam coming up? Oh, Do they need like, any safe in Guam? Yeah. I think uh, I think they do. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, sounds like sounds like we're going to Guam. Yeah, we love. Well, <laughs> I think Brett would be through the roof if we turned up at his door. I think he's quite the fan, so we we love hearing from you, Brett. Good man, Spe- especially if you bought a t-shirt and a stubby cooler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also got a note from John Schaefer in the US. The Harrington Harbour Regatta. Actually, it's called the Harrington Harbour Ha Ha. A rally for the entire oh. family. It's on. Did you read the? Uh, I'm reading it out. Notice the race. There yeah, you go. So it. it's on Saturday, the sixth of July. Well, that was 2019. It says on the sailing instructions. So yeah, I don't think the sailing instructions change. Yeah, <laughs> no, the date will be the, just, uh, just forgot the dates, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgot, so, to, forgot to change the date. A date around that date. All right. It's a free <laughs> fun event to open to all sailors. Uh, a short fun race in Herring Bay. The boats start from an anchored position. No close starting manoeuvring required and finish in an anchored position with the final <laughs> leg, a swim or row or paddle board from the boat to the finish line on the beach. And then a party will be held on the East Beach after the parlay of the skipper's court. The parlay, of course, is instead of doing your penalty turns, you've got to bribe, you've got to bribe your, uh, the officials to stay in the race. So... <laughs> Because you <laughs> love it, love yeah. it. So, um, contact John Schaefer or at here, I'll get his email address 445. The number's 445 velocity at gmail.com. There you go. Um, so that sounds like a fun one. Anybody want well, to go I to have, that one? Well, my, my only comment there is uh, if anyone sees a bar karate, um, battle flag flying <laughs> in St. Martin this year, there you go. John there Schaefer you go. will be on the boat, um, and he will be hosting. A bar karate party on our behalf. I, I was about to say, I, I'd have to say he's nearly our biggest fan. He's gone out and made himself his battle flag and he's got a photo of it today and uh, he sent it through. So, yeah, super. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Bravo. Just make sure you behave yourself, John, and um, <laughs> enough about the Terps, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. um, yeah, keep it, keep it clean and don't do what you said on uh, Messenger, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to skip a bunch of things because we're running out of time hard, guys. We're having too much fun. Um, I do have to ask, secret pro news? Nothing. Any secret pro news? Negative. Nothing. We have to – hang on, hang on. I've got something. I guess we can't say that. I've had to put it through the shredder. (laughs) 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 I've used a joke, Bicey. Um. All right, no secret pro news. Around the grounds, ladies and gentlemen, the 49er, 49er FX and NACRA Worlds start at Royal Geelong uh, in the next day or two, this week. Um, I could have sworn they only just had them in New Zealand about a month ago. Um, 
But yeah. apparently yeah. they're doing them again. Yeah, no, the 2019 World. 20, yeah. in the 2020. <laughs> Come on, Jordan. <laughs> We're in 2020 now, mate. The, imagine winning those world championships and only getting to hold the trophy for a month. You don't even get to take it home. You're still here training. <laughs> You're still flying to your next event. <laughs> um, Just get your boat out of the container. Oh, I've got to give it back. Who do, who's going to win? Uh, Caroline, who's going to win? Jason Waterhouse, Lisa Dermanen. Whoa. Ooh, in, the, cool. in the 49ers. There's no, there's no Dutchies <laughs> in the... Uh, in the NACRA, so no, no. I can say that safely. Yeah, so the NACRA, so they finished third at the last Worlds, uh, and they have always been right up there, silver medalist from the last Olympics. We just had uh, Santi uh, Langer on, uh, on our program, and he was ninth at the Worlds, and he won the gold medal, so he's uh, potential. The Italian mm. team, the Denmark team, first and second at the Worlds that have just been only a few weeks ago. So there you go. What about the 49ers? Anyone want to go out on a limb and suggest a team that might win the 49ers? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. no I, I couldn't possibly. Don't know the fleet well enough. Um, Kiwis. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Is there <laughs> somewhere? Someone from New Zealand? Yeah, that's him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, who's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get one of them he, on, actually. No, no. Has, yeah. he, has, he, has he sailed before or is yeah. this a newcomer? <laughs> yeah. Go on, move on, move on. We'll get one of them on. So, anyway, we'll probably, in our midweek program, we might do a little touch on to see where things are going. So, that, that's pretty cool. Um, t-shirt design, have we progressed our T-shirt designs? BP, have you done yeah. anything? Yeah, no, no chance, you blokes. No chance? Bicey. have you spent less than $1,000 so far in the development of the T-shirts? Negative. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline. No, not just the T-shirts, just the design. Yeah, <laughs> the design. Yeah, right. not even and I haven't even won it yet. But you blokes bars will pull out now. All right, all right. Um, Caroline, all right. would I'm you gonna, like to I'm enter hope, our T-shirt? I hope, I hope there's a sample in Lincoln when I see you. And I hope it's not like, you know, super silk and uh, skin tight. Oh. Hey mate, you've seen with us a, all right with a with a hood with a hood. Right. Um, Caroline, would you like to enter the T-shirt design challenge? No, thank you. Uh, Too much competition. It just... is huge. It is huge. The competition. You should hear I the. Can't band. wait to see Jordan's flannel. Flannel yeah. T-shirt. Actually, that was one of my ideas, and somebody's pinched it. The the flannel uh, uh, safety shirt. You know, like the. Uh, you know, you always high-vis. see the high vis shirts. You always see someone with grey and orange at the top, or fluoro yellow and blue. I just thought uh, uh, a high vis shirt with the flannel pattern that it sell hey, by the truckload. A tradie doesn't spend them to- their time out of a flannel or high vis. That's it. So you might so as well combine them, and then he doesn't have to change anything. Yeah. Chuck in a hard yak or uh, a Bond singlet. There You're you all, go. good. Oh, all good. And a packet of Winnie Blue. <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, right. Okay. So, all right. So, Caroline. Uh, so, then the way you can contribute to the t-shirt design, Caroline, is next. Is it next week? We're putting them up. Well, either. Well, yeah. Next week must be the week because um, the week after will be the Teakle Blue Water Classic. So, yeah. okay. um, we'll have other things on then. Um, well, yeah. So the uh, the way you can contribute, Caroline, is just to vote for my shirt as the winning <laughs> shirt. <laughs> So, but for any of the yes? listeners so out there, if boring. they have any good so ideas for all a, this stuff. if they have any good <laughs> ideas stuff. for a logo or a t-shirt, send it into Cheers at Bar Karate, or um, you can use any of the other platforms with DM with uh, Instagram or Facebook. And in saying that, when you are on either of the any of the platforms, rate us five stars, write a review. If you don't like us, as Jordan says, Jordan. Just send send money. Send money. Um, <laughs> I love, and, you know, but I have I a, I, I've gone, sorry, I really have a mission for all our listeners, and we actually get some diag- – well, what do you call uh, We get to see um, where the majority of the listeners come from, et cetera, et cetera. But this week's challenge for all our listeners, tell your mates – because we love what we're doing. And after a day like today, for example, down at the Brighton Seacliff Yacht Club, we love doing stuff like that. So if we can get more listeners, more opportunities like that are going to come up. So um, tell your mates, we, we, we could get be on your board. Club. We could be Absolutely. your club. 
All right. All right, we've got to move to a finish because we're super far out of time and I think Caroline probably long, wants to go to bed. Long, isn't yep. it? Yep, we've been charging. Um, so the quiz question, first off, the oldest house found in the British Isles was unearthed at the Star Car site near Scarborough where uh, Andrew Pinder's from. And um, I asked... Was, when, that, was it his house? Yeah, when it, what, <laughs> what year it dates back to. So the oldest house in Britain, how old it's from up where Andy, Andrew's from? How, what was the date it dates from? It was from 8,500 BC. Houses. Jesus. That's an old Houses. house. Wow. <laughs> All right. Now, um, we're just about to sign off. So, Carol and Brower, we are incredibly grateful for you spending time with three idiots. Um, and the fact that you're, you've chosen to live with another idiot is just... Uh, <laughs> well, I haven't said... You haven't said idiot all show. You're now at 862. <laughs> Four skulls in the last 12 seconds. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Got to finish off. So, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed uh, chatting to you. Uh, obviously, we'll have an open invitation for you. As soon as you do that I mock a 60 ride and you announce your new team, you'll just come on board. <laughs> do the announcement here. Bye. And by the way, and, I'm, serious, um, I'm serious about the invitation next week. Come for a little sail on the sports boat, Nationals, for a laugh. That'll be fun. And uh, we look Count forward to in. seeing Sounds you. Like fun. We there look you forward to seeing you at the Sail GP, and we'll hand over all our guest special um, merchandise packages <laughs> at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> Very much looking forward to it. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, it's an absolute Thanks, okay. I've got a question. Yeah, our final question. You. You have to uh, you, now. You know the answer because it's written on your little sheet there, but don't say the answer. But the question, <laughs> the final question, we know the Dutchies are the tallest nation in the world. The question is, no what, doubt. What item do they consume more than any other nation in the world? And it's not alcohol related. Okay, so I don't want to get in trouble for alcohol. So that's Frickendale. the question. Strip waffle. <laughs> strip waffle. I, I reckon I might add to the, uh, yeah, the tally of strip yeah, waffle consumption. You might win that one. <laughs> oh, dear. There's yeah. actually um, there's a bakery, a Dutch bakery, just around the corner from my place. So they make these apple donut things. Don't tell my wife. I sneak yeah. a few of those occasionally. Apple flapper. <laughs> They're so good. They're so good. Apple flapper. Apple flapper. Yeah. Apple flapper. I'm apple flapper. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> see you later right. <laughs> alright see you everyone thank you thank you well, it's all right now.